On July 6, 1944, what began as a fun summer day in Hartford, Connecticut, would go from cheerful to tragic in under 10 minutes. During this era, it was common for circuses to make way across the United States carrying their big top circus tent and all of their spectacles by train. This is how the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus brought their show to Hartford just a day prior to the fateful event. The train, however, experienced delays which caused the circus to cancel its first show of the day. While certainly disappointing to those excitedly waiting to attend the performance, it was perhaps worse for the performers. Circus performers are known to be fairly superstitious, along with not eating peanuts backstage and never entering the ring with one's left foot it's considered very bad luck to miss a show. In fact, the phrase now popular in show business, the show must go on, originated in circuses during the 19th century and demonstrates the strong push to continue with a performance despite anything that might happen. The fact that they missed their first of two scheduled shows on the day of their arrival likely generated some anxieties for the circus employees. Nonetheless, their show on the evening of July 5th went off without a hitch and they were able to put the unlucky day behind them, or so they thought. The following afternoon, looking for a way out of the miserably hot summer sun, spectators filed into the big top tent to catch the 215 performance. The immense tent was capable of seating 9,000 patrons. It measured 200 feet wide by 450 feet long and was 48 feet tall at its peak. The audience took their seats surrounding the three rings in the center where they anticipated clowns, trapeze artists, exotic animal demonstrations, and other exciting circus events. Some seven to 8,000 people were in attendance for the show. This event took place during the height of World War II. In fact, it was a month to the day following the notorious D-Day landing on the beaches of Normandy, France. The war effort was largely the cause for the delay experienced by the Ringling Brothers train on the prior day. But another result of the war raging in Europe was that many adults were off working long hours in production plants to support the war efforts. Furthermore, many men had been drafted into the military to fight overseas. For this reason, the majority of the attendees were women and children. After the crowd was wowed by famed French lion tamer Alfred Court, they were equally enamored with the daring stunts performed by trapeze artists, the Great Wallendas. It was around this time that a small fire was spotted by circus band leader Merle Evans. At about 2.40 p.m., Evans instructed the circus band to play Stars and Stripes Forever. While innocuous to unwitting patrons, this song serves as an SOS to circus employees. Circus stagehands responded to the distress signal, hurried to the west end of the tent, and attempted to extinguish the flame. They threw buckets of water on it, which had been kept with the intent of dousing small fires. Despite their efforts, the fire quickly made its way up the side walls of the tent. It's important to note that the tent was made from canvas, which is flammable enough on its own. But to make the canvas waterproof, it was dipped in paraffin wax. Paraffin wax, not being thin enough on its own to coat the canvas, was diluted with gasoline prior to being used as a waterproofing agent. Once the flame reached the top of the 15-foot sidewall, it took mere minutes to devour the top of the great tent. Audience members went from waiting patiently for the fire to be extinguished to panicking as the wax and gas-coated canvas rained down onto them like napalm. The circus ringmaster, Fred Bradna, attempted to control the situation by imploring visitors to leave in an orderly fashion and not to panic. His directions, however, went unheard as the power to his microphone had been lost. As the reality of the situation set in, hysteria ensued. Witnesses noted that some people ran in panic circles. Some stayed in their seats either too scared to move or hopelessly waiting for the fire to be put out, 
Naturally, most in attendance fled to the exits. However, several of them were blocked by circus wagons or the chutes that were used to bring the exotic animals in and out of the rings. Including the main entrance, there were nine exits overall, but it was a gamble as to which exits would be passable. Fortunately, circus staff were able to use these chutes to get animals away from the burning tent and they suffered only minor burns, but these chutes posed a deadly obstacle for the people in attendance. In the chaos, some people began cutting and tearing holes into the canvas to make their own exits. In recent years, Maureen Krekian, a survivor who was 11 years old at the time, described the pandemonium at the scene. The exit was blocked with the cages that the animals were brought in and out with, and there was a man taking kids and flinging them up and over the cage to get them out. I was sitting up in the bleachers and jumped down. I was three quarters of the way up. You jump down and it was all straw underneath. There was a young man, a kid. He had a pocket knife and he slit the tent, took my arm and pulled me out. Sadly, many unfortunate victims were unable to elude the flames. It took only eight minutes for the big top to completely burn to the ground. In all, an estimated 168 people lost their lives from burning, smoke inhalation, being trampled by the stampede of the panicked crowd, or jumping from the top of the ten and a half foot bleachers in an attempt to escape under the side walls of the tent. As many as two thirds of those victims were children. In addition to the fatalities, there was a significant number of injuries, some being dire. Sources vary widely on how many people were actually injured but it's commonly accepted that it was between five and seven hundred. It's hard to get a solid estimate on the numbers of injuries because many of those injured left immediately after escaping. The majority of those in attendance, including the performers, managed to survive physically unscathed. However, the psychological trauma they endured was significant and wouldn't be easily shaken off. Well-known circus clown Emmett Kelly is such an example. He was famously photographed carrying a single bucket of water outside the fire in a desperate attempt to do everything he could to help. He was forever burdened with the scar of that tragedy in Hartford. His relatives noted that he would only talk about the disaster to members of his family. Carol Tillman Parrish, who attended the circus with the Arsenal School summer camp, survived the fire at only six years old. In 2014, on the 70th anniversary of the disaster, Tillman was quoted as saying, Until this day, I can smell the stench of human flesh. The cause of the fire has never been determined for certain. One theory is that it was caused by a lit cigarette being carelessly discarded in the men's room. While this theory is widely accepted to be true by many today, there's an alternate theory that holds significant weight in the eyes of others. That it was arson. There doesn't appear to be any records to indicate that arson was suspected at the time of the fire, but an unexpected turn of events took place six years later in 1950. Robert Dale Segui was arrested in Ohio for starting multiple fires. While in custody, he was interrogated by Ohio police and confessed to starting fires in several states, and even confessed to four murders. While confessing to his crimes, he noted committing arson in Ohio, New Hampshire, Maine, and specifically confessed to starting the fire at the Ringling Bros and Barnum and Bailey Circus in Hartford in 1944. In his confession, he was supposedly quoted as saying, I was at the Hartford Circus. I saw the Red Indian, and then I woke up and the tent was on fire. He also stated that he had been committing arson since the age of six, and that the Red Indian he mentioned was that of an apparition who he said would visit him regularly on a flaming horse and urge him to set fires. This revelation was truly shocking especially since Sagi was, in fact, employed by the circus as part of the lighting crew during the time of the fire. 
Despite the horrific discovery, the authorities in Ohio refused to allow the investigators in Connecticut to interview Sagi regarding the Hartford Circus Fire. Sagi, who was only 14 years old when the fire happened, later recanted his confession and said that he only made it under extreme duress from Ohio authorities. A false confession would not be incredibly surprising given Sagi's history of mental illness. Although, neither would a tendency to commit arson, especially considering the unsettling commentary he made about the apparition who implored him to set those fires. In any case, he was sentenced to prison for his crimes in Ohio, where he served four years before being declared a paranoid schizophrenic and subsequently committed to Lima State Hospital for the insane. It wasn't until March 16, 1993, 49 years after the fire, that Sagi was interviewed by the Connecticut State Police. In that interview, Sagi vehemently denied any involvement in starting the fire. Instead, saying that he was pressured into admitting to the crimes by authorities. He stated that he was actually in downtown Hartford watching a movie when the fire occurred, and that he only heard about it while riding the bus on the way back. During that 1993 interview with the Connecticut State Police, he made his official opinion known, stating, I don't think really anybody really started that fire. It was the goddamn hot sun that started that fire, but they had to blame somebody. He also noted that he joined the circus in Portland, Maine, just four or five days before the fire. Despite the shocking twist Sagi's confession brought about in 1950, it is still unknown if the fire was arson or just a tragic accident. While Sagi was never linked with any wrongdoing in the fire, charges of manslaughter were filed against several Ringling Brothers circus officials. An investigation revealed an appalling lack of fire safety preparedness. Notably, at the time of the performance, the fire extinguishers were completely inaccessible, buried in a storage unit. They were also charged with failing to notify the Hartford Fire Department of their arrival and intent to perform. The officials were convicted and served sentences ranging from six months to a year. Several sentences would have been longer, but they were eventually pardoned and released. The circus was ordered to pay compensation to the families of the victims, the agreement was for nearly $5 million and stipulated that families had until 1954 to make their claim. The settlement amount would be worth roughly $83 million in 2022 and was paid out to about 600 family members. In 2004, a memorial was built to honor the memory of the lives lost in the Hartford Circus Fire. As for the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, they closed their operations permanently in 2017. In their farewell tour, they made sure the final stop was a performance in Hartford, Connecticut. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Hit the bell icon to get notifications when I release a new video. If you're interested in supporting Motive Horror and gaining access to exclusive perks and merchandise, use the link in the description to become a patron of my Patreon. Until next time.